Hello everyone, just starting up the stream so that we can um, um, get week four up and running. Just going to wait to make sure that I can see that it's actually live before I switch over and start talking about real stuff. Okay, seems like it's live. So anyways, uh, just a quick note, I always like to chain this out at the top of the hour. I'll be looking, today I'll be talking about um, the project introduction because that's due shortly. I'll be talking about the... Um, um, the, the survey that I distributed last time uh, that, that we did and we got some answers from, uh, the use, like the, the student survey. So the, your responses to it. Um, and then I'll be talking about, uh, social media ROI because that's also a topic that, uh, we had the readings for, um, this week, you know, and I also like that. The, it, so if you have any questions about any of that, um, Plea or anything else in the class for that matter. Um, please send them in by email or tweet at them ahead of time. Um, one other thing I want to mention briefly is the project contract because that's also mentioned. Um, and if you have a question while we're broadcasting live here, uh, you can put it into the chat on YouTube. And just a quick reminder, try and do that early on in the show, uh, in the in the broadcast because um, the, there's actually a little bit of a delay between when I'm talking and what you're seeing. So if you try and wait until the very last minute to chime in, um, I may have already hung up by the time you ask your question. So put it in earlier, okay? Um, so what's going on this week? Let's chat quickly about that at the top of the hour just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so I sent out an email earlier today with kind of the, the standard what you need to do and things like that. And it had all of the, the details of what's going on. Uh, but of course, watching the videos is important. Um, participating in the top hat discussion uh, is up there as well. Just got authorized my login to the Moodle, um, and uh, you know, reading the new um, the new discussion. So it's on Follower Factory for the new discussion aspect, um, and this has come up in a couple of discussions online and in the class uh, where people have been interested in how influencer campaigns work. And this one specifically is looking at the, like the creation of artificial followers, so that's a negative aspect. And we'll we'll look at some other aspects as we go through. Um, watch, uh, you know, you should. I highly recommend that you watch the week three office hours if you haven't. And if you're here, you're participating in week four. And the optional uh, assignment for this week is to read chapter seventeen. Now this week, is, like like last week's a little bit of a down week, and then we don't have any big assignments due. But next week's gonna uh, have a bunch of different assignments and content due. So. I will be telling you about that as we get close or as we go through. Okay, so right off the bat, I want to make sure we kind of talk about uh, the um, the uh, social media ROI reading. So this was the reading that you were assigned last week, um, and let me pull up my kind of little slides I have on them that you saw already. Um, but essentially this reading, you know, and one of the authors is a friend of mine, Donna Hoffman, is kind of uh, a good discussion about like what the point of social media is. And kind of the big argument that it makes is that, um, you know, social media ROI should not be measured by uh, standard expense versus profits. Instead, it should be measured by effort versus effort, right? How much effort do you have to put in versus how much effort do you get from the consumers and spreading your the word uh, the good word about your company or your organization? And let me pull up. Oh, that's not that one. Okay, let me pull up that window real quick. With I have a couple of quick slides that I think I already put up online to share with you. I'm having trouble hitting the buttons in the right order. Okay, so um, keynote there we go okay so as you can see right uh let me blow this up a little bit differently right um so as we were just describing right social media roa is rather than start thinking of profits think about consumer motivation to use social media and then how you might invest to get people to contribute to goals in that space right and part of the argument here right is kind of an old school argument which is basically you know, not all forms of marketing and advertising have to be directly linked to sales, right? We um, we eventually want them to all result in sales. That is, in fact, the point of most companies out there, right? 
But in the end, right, like they don't have to be directly linked. There could be a lot of intermediate um, steps that might be more useful to focus on. And in fact, that focusing on sales may in fact cause us to shorthand or, or, or second, you know, short change, that's the word I'm looking for, the benefit of using some of these other approaches, right? And one of the things I like about this particular um, article is that they do a good job of kind of going through what is the use of social media? And they talk specifically about brand awareness, brand engagement, and word of mouth. And then they go through each of the different channels that you look at, blogs, microblogs, um, co-creation setups, right? Um, like Nike ID and Nike Plus, social bookmarking, forums and discussion boards, product reviews, social networks, and video and photo sharing. And, you know, these topic areas kind of closely parallel the taxonomy that I presented earlier in the social media channels. Um, and so then once you have those, then they talk about the three types of objectives you might have, which is brand awareness, brand engagement, and word of mouth. And then for each of those, within each of those different social media con categories, they describe how you might think of, um, of another criteria you might use instead of profit to maximize. And so I think this is really a nice construct way, concrete way of looking at it. So if we're interested, if so, for instance, if you're planning to use a blog to increase brand engagement, then tracking the number of members and the number of RSS feed subscribers is a good way to go. Whereas if you're going to use product reviews to track word of mouth, then looking at the number of reviews posted, um, the valence of those reviews, things like that are useful to track, right? And social media, you know, it's not clear that um, in all cases it could be useful right, uh, for every single context. Uh, um, but, you know, you try to think about how you're going to use it in this particular context and for what purposes is, is a useful exercise, right? Um, so what are some strategic options, right? So every manager's goal, right, should be to move away from fuzzy measurement and toward quantifiable metrics. This way, a manager can understand what's working and what's not, and then revise their approach accordingly, right? And so, if you are using fuzzy kind of measurement, right? Like if you don't really know how to relate your social media spend to your profits, right? And you think that the campaign you launched is failing, then you're kind of at a dead end. But if, you know, the, if the, and if the campaign is succeeding, you're essentially a naive optimist because you don't know why it's succeeding, right? But if you can move to quantifiable measurements, then if it's failing, you can measure and adjust and if it's succeeding, you can iterate on that plan and continue to succeed, right? I think that's a very important way to think about why you should be investing in social media ROI, right? Um, now, uh, let's kind of look at some of the questions that came up during the, the reading, right? Um, so... Um, it seems like most of the most of you kind of in the top hat scenario kind of understood what was going on, right, and kind of got the basic scenario pretty well. Um, there was an interesting set of discussions about um, just whether um, you know whether brand awareness was more important, whether obtaining customer loyalty was more important, and to establish the metrics in that space, right. Uh, but in fact, I think that social media can be used for many of these cases. And in fact, one of the ones. Um, that they talk about in there, the Southwest, uh, Nuts for Southwest is the campaign, right? Um, I think that's a very interesting one. I highly encourage you to go take a look at it. In my offline cast, we also we often do a little in-class exercise around it where we talk about the fact that, you know, this blog has a lot of interesting content on it. It's now called Southwest Stories, not Nuts for Southwest. But it doesn't seem to be causing a lot of engagement or brand awareness or word of mouth. So how could you if you wanted to relaunch that blog, how can you do it in a way that would kind of have the same impact? And why did it lose that impact, right? And so I think that's kind of a, a kind of mini use case. That's kind of mini case that's kind of interesting. Um, the goal for social media ROI, right, in many of these cases, to be able to accurately quantify your return using measurements that aren't directly related to profit, right? And so trying to think through like what, like maybe go to the Southwest blog and look at it and say, what would I do on this blog to really quantify whether I was getting the engagement or the brand awareness that I wanted on this blog, right? Um, 
And, you know, quite frankly, the last question that I asked uh, in the top hat forum, is there a best social media for every business? Right? The answer seems pretty uh, opposite, that there, that there is, there isn't a single best social media channel. But yes, there might be a particular social media channel that's better for one than another, right? Uh, often there is at least one of the social media channels that will work for every single case. Now, it could be that there are some some products and services that won't work for every that won't work for any. Sorry, let me step back and re say that there are some products and services for which social media is just not an answer, right? But almost all of them kind of can really, can use at least one of these to some success, right? And I guess it's also a question of like, do you emphasize that channel right away or do you come into it later, right? And so um, there's a lot of leeway in some of these different answers, that's for sure. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I really wanted to say about social media ROI. Um, as I mentioned, right, like let, if I can turn on this one window again, you know, if you want kind of a quick exercise to follow up on that, take the Southwest Stories blog, right, and just try and figure out how you would measure, first of all, would you concentrate on brand awareness, brand games, or word of mouth, and how would you measure it for that campaign? And then do you really want an example that kind of matches up well with what we're doing in the group project? Think about writing a single smart goal that would best help out the campaign. So that's it's a simple discussion of uh, social media ROI. Um, there was a question. Okay, yeah. So that's that's the basic idea. Um, so let's see. okay. Now a couple other things I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, project introduction and uh, contract. Actually, I'm going to end there. Let me talk about the. Um, the survey. So there we go. Okay. Because I did not, I ran out of time to talk about this last week. I meant to talk about it last week. Actually, let me do it this way. No, I can't do it that way. Okay. Yeah, I had a new window, unfortunately. I was trying to save, not having to create more windows. Okay, so it should be coming up any minute now, hopefully. There we go, okay. Let me get it so it's better centered. There we go, okay. So I always like to present back to you the survey results that I do. And the reason why I like to present back to you those survey results is simply because of the fact that um, they are, um, 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 I want you to get the understanding. So a lot of people ask me these questions early on. Do I need to know programming? Do I need to know web design? Do I need to know how to create social media content? And the answer to all that is no, right? We're gonna teach you a lot of that in this class. Plus you're gonna work with other students who do it. And now what I wanna show you the survey results for, one of the big reasons why I wanna show them to you is because of the fact that I want you to get the idea that this isn't a diverse group. Um, but there's some other things I think you'll find interesting along the way. So first of all, what is the top concentration of the students who are taking this class? Well, they're marketing, finance, innovation, and supply chain are tied, right? And there, I might've missed a couple of other votes in there, right, that would break the tie between innovation and supply chain because you might type supply chain management versus supply chain or something like that. But, um, but that's roughly, and that seems to bear up pretty consistently over the course of this class. Uh, have you ever designed a web page or a website? Most people, the answer is no, but you know, about half of you have, so you got some ability to think about how to create digital marketing content. Um, you know, what pro programming languages have you worked in? Um, and most people have not actually worked in what we would consider a programming language. They've instead worked with like Wix or Google site or WordPress where they kind of built the tool themselves or sorry, that the tool is already pre-built. You're not really writing a language. It's kind of more like using a word processor to design a website. And that's fine, right? Interestingly enough, no one's used Expression Web anymore, which was what I started out teaching this class in back in the day when the Wix and Google Sites solutions weren't as popular as some of those other solutions. How would you describe your comfort level of designing web pages? Over half of you say, you know, so this is interesting, right? So more than half of you, or just under half of you have designed one, but even more than that, say they don't have a clue. So even though you've designed one, you don't really have a clue how to do it, right? Which is fine, and that's great, right? And so we're gonna kind of teach you some of the ideas about how to approach that throughout this class. 
how comfortable are you with a variety of different programming languages? And the vast majority answer is they've never used any of them, except for some people, you know, there seems to be some group that has used HTML. Have you ever designed a social media presence for something other than your own Facebook or Twitter page? And basically what I'm asking here, right, is have you tried to build a social media campaign for someone who isn't you, right? Um, and not to say that your own experiences aren't valid, but it's useful to know. And about two thirds of you have it and one third had, right? By the way, a small aside, this is combining the online and the offline class. That's why the, the number is off at around 65, which is the total between the two classes, I believe. Um, do you know what cloud computing is? And two thirds of you said yes, right? One of the reasons why this question is on here is because I try and keep a somewhat consistent set of questions over the years. I like to see how this is very, and this has definitely gone up, right? And you know, cloud computing is basically the idea that you connect to a computing resource that's not physically located um, in your same environment or in your same business, right? That you said you're renting that space uh, from someone else, right? Or that you have a private cloud where you're just attaching yourself to that space uh, for a brief amount. And it's kind of the idea that the computing is on demand whenever you need it. Right? How many hours do you spend on the internet? And this one I love because this graph is so big, there's big chunks of lots of things, right? The plurality is more than 20, but you know, 16 to 20, 11 to 15, six to 10, and even two to five all get pretty decent chunks, right? And this is a, kind of repeats one of the notions that I mentioned early on, that extrapolating from your use case of digital marketing to the whole world is a foolish endeavor, right? You need to think about what who you're actually targeting and which of these different pies they actually fall into. At what age did you start using the internet? And unfortunately, the way Google Charts does this, it didn't really order this really well, uh, but most people, it seems like, are in like the 10 to 15 year old kind of stage with a plurality at 12, uh, a decent amount at nine, and actually a considerable amount at six, right? Um, this is something that's also changed over the years. My my daughters technically both had uh, tablets at the age of uh, two, I believe, or maybe it's three. I can't remember when we held off. But um, but still, that would put them, you know, that would they were starting to use the internet even though they didn't realize it at that age. Do you have a Twitter account? Two thirds say yes, one third said no. I've been teaching this class since about 2008, right? And so this number has increased dramatically. I think the first time I taught it, there was like one person in the class who had a Twitter account. Do you have a personal Facebook page? Um, one quarter of you said no, uh, but two, three quarters said yes. And that's interesting. That's definitely a change. You know, it used to be that everyone had one. And we're seeing a little bit of drop off. That being said, I feel like I see a stat every year that says everyone's leaving Facebook and I see a stat that they, they do the next day. Um, actually, it's usually a story, not a stat that says everyone's leaving Facebook. And then when they run the actual stats, it turns out that most people aren't. But, you know, maybe this is changing. Maybe this is switching. Um, one thing I do know is that, you know, we probably won't be able to predict the demise of Facebook very well, right? Um, uh, Friendster uh, was, or sorry, MySpace was the dominant social media platform up until the year it wasn't, right? It basically, in one year, it went from a 90% market share to like a 10% market share. And Facebook went from a 10% market share to a 90% market share, right? Those, those numbers aren't quite exactly right, obviously, because there were other social media platforms, but still, it was roughly that kind of big of a trade-off. Do you use Pinterest? Uh, just over half of you do. So that's kind of an interesting um, statistic. And in fact, Pinterest is interesting as a social media platform, because when we talk about social media and sales, Pinterest is one of the few social media platforms that has um, been shown to actually directly result in sales. About one out of every three clicks on Pinterest results in a at least um, uh, interest being shown in a product, right? Um, and something like one out of every five results in an actual sale. It's kind of ridiculous how useful Pinterest is for generating actual sales. Do you use Instagram? This number has been going up, right? It's obviously now it's now at two thirds with a one third saying no. Um, uh, so that that's an increasing share. And WhatsApp as well. This number was actually really small even in the last couple of years, but that's growing extraordinarily amounts by extraordinary amounts, right? Um, so it's interesting to see how that's changed. Um, and, you know, part of this might be just the growth of 
uh, lots of Wi-Fi, right? Making it easy to use tools like this, the desire to work across platforms. WhatsApp's been popular overseas for a lot longer than it has in the US. US text messages basically were the same price no matter where you sent them, so it didn't really matter. Whereas in Europe, for instance, it can sometimes be expensive to send the text just across the country, uh, you know, in between two countries, even if you're separated by not too much, it was often incurred a surcharge. So WhatsApp uses a, what's called an OTT or over the top technology, allowing you to sell, send um, SMS messages using standard internet, right? Which is cheaper than using the telephone companies. And almost all of you have a, a LinkedIn account. Whoever these people are probably need to get one, or maybe they already have jobs and don't really have to worry about it anymore. But uh, you probably should have a LinkedIn account if you're going to be job seeking in the near future. Do you actively contribute to Reddit? And that's like the exact opposite graph, right? Um, and most people said no. I think that's an area you're going to see increasing, though. There's always, you know, on all contributions, right, there's always this fact that. Uh, and there's a power law relationship where a lot of people don't contribute anything and a few people contribute a few things. Do you have your own blog, right? Most people don't, but there are a few people out there that do. Does, do you know of anyone who's got married as a result of an online dating site, right? There's still one fifth of the population still doesn't, but this number is also obviously increasing. And, um, you know, it's kind of intriguing that nowadays. Um, it seems like all of my friends who are um, getting married, though, most of my friends are either already married or working on their second marriage at this point. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they almost all meet someone over online nowadays. And again, this is an interesting stat, right? Um, how do you most access the internet? And if you take that 42.9 to 31 point, sorry, not the 31.7, 17.5 number, you're talking about smartphones, right? So well over half of you use a smartphone, right? Another third are using um, a uh, um, a laptop, right? And then there's a group using a desktop computer or an iPad as their primary access. How often do you check your mail a day, email a day? Most people say every hour, right? Um, which is interesting to me. As you know, I have a unique process. I, I check, I think I've talked about some of the other videos. I check my mail almost every hour, uh, but I don't respond to it until the end of the day. So. Um, that kind of per allows me to, it's amazing how many email conversations you save yourself having to reply to by not responding right away. <laughs> how often do you text? And this one I always find fascinating that I need to, maybe I need to up that upper number so that there's like a 40 or 50 plus option because um, the plurality now is at the 30 plus times per day, right? Which kind of amazes me, right? Considering the fact that that's a technology that didn't really even exist or was in its infancy at least uh, 20 years ago, right? So, um, eh, yeah, 20 years ago, it's in its, you could text, but it was in its infancy 20 years ago. 25 is basically not around. Okay, so that's it for the survey. Hopefully that gives you a little, an a little insight into who your colleague, your, your various classmates are. And, you know, the other thing is that I think it reinforces the point that we're, we're not all the same, right? There's definitely different chunks of those different graphs that we're all in, which means that using a uniform digital marketing policy for everyone is kind of a bad idea. You should really find out what your particular base does. Right? Okay. So finally, let me bring up the project uh, documents. But before I do that, I, I'm just going to talk about the project introduction. The project scope, I've had a bunch of questions come in on, like, do you want... Um, virtual signatures are those okay right how much detail do you want the project scope to go into all those kind of things at uh, the scope sorry project contract i keep saying scope i mean contract the the whole goal of the project contract is really not something that i'm going to grade in depth basically you get a check or a check or no check right if you turn in the project contract and it seems to make sense to me the team contract you get a check what i want that what the team contract is for is for your team to have a personal agreement amongst yourselves as to how you're going to undertake the project, right? I serve as an honest broker. You send a copy of it to me, and that way at the end of the semester, if there's some disagreements that someone did or did not do their work, then, then I can kind of arbitrate based upon the contract. The other reason why is because, you know, this is a semester-long project. It takes a while to get everything done. 
I'd rather have you start thinking about who's going to do what now than who's going to do what, say, two months from now, right? Um, so that's the other goal of the project contract. So don't worry too much about the details, I guess is what I'm getting to for the project contract, it is really meant uh, to be kind of as an aid to you and not really as uh, something I'm going to grade in any depth. Okay, no, not that one. Yep. Oh, wait, that's weird. Okay, let me remove that. Okay, I'm trying to pull up the project introduction. So here's the team project paper thing. Let me make this a little smaller or a little bigger, sorry. All right, okay. Let me make it bigger this way too. Oh, no, that's not what I want to. Nope, don't want to move my picture. I'm gonna have trouble clicking on this thing. Oh, there you go, okay. Um, so, So as you can see, you know, we're coming up on the first turn in for the project, the team project, right? And there's a brief description of the structure of the report. Oh, sorry about that. Um, but essentially, you know, this first turn in is just to kind of, um, to, to, to basically give me some indications that you actually understand what company you're working with and why you're working with them and why they need digital marketing, right? So if at all possible, I have to recommend that you have a conversation with your company before you write the project introduction. Um, and the real thing I'm looking for is this section four, right? You you don't really have to do section you If you already have some insights, you can write them up, that's great. Uh, but you know, section four is the thing I'm most interested in seeing, right? So this includes a short profile of the company, who they are, what they do, and then also include a justification for marketing on the internet. Talk about what the product or service is, what the value proposition and revenue model is um, and why they need a digital marketing campaign. And that's it. So these are like, you know, probably just over a page, maybe two to three pages at the most, right? Um, and you're gonna turn that in on February 7th, right? Um, and really, I'm just kind of looking to make sure that you have identified a company and that you have some understanding of what the company does and why they need digital marketing, okay? Um, so that's that's all it is. The other thing I would mention right now, because it's another assignment, is that you're also going to, on February 7th, receive your first um, take-home assignment What for you. They're all take-homes, but uh, um, essentially it is the, the conceptual assignment. So the way this is gonna look is it's gonna be a reading, probably a brief mini case of some sort, and then you're gonna have about five questions and you're gonna have to write about half a paragraph, or sorry, half a page for each question. So about two and a half pages of text total to answer those questions and you have one week to fill that out and do it, okay? So that's the project, uh, so that's the conceptual assignment, which will be, you'll see, it'll be posted on February 7th. Okay, let me move over. I saw there was a couple questions in the chat. They mean to uh, blah, blah, yeah, ish, but I just kinda wanna make sure I kinda got these questions. So, there's a question. Could you explain how students in the past got access to their website, Facebook, or Twitter accounts if they were going to revamp it or collect any type of analytics from these accounts? Um, you know, so a lot of times you can do this with having no access to the accounts. You can do it with having full access to the accounts. It really, you know, whatever you have, you can work with. If you have full access, that's great. Go in there, use it, you know, and in many places they just talked to the company and they said, hey, would you mind if we took a look at your analytics? Either they got the whoever's in charge of it right now to send them a report, or in some cases, the company doesn't even know that you can run analytics, and they asked for the company to provide them uh, with the passwords so they could go in and collect the analytics themselves, right? Um, if you're going to revamp them, right, one thing you can do, right, if you don't have any access, would be to kind of look at the publicly available information. So for both Facebook and Twitter, you can see how many people are, are publicly commenting, right? Um, for the website, you don't really get as much information, but you might, if you're gonna revamp it, you can at least see what the content is, right? And so a lot of times students will take screenshots or something like that and then mock up new versions of the same thing. The next question I used to ask is, is there an NC State legal document that would potentially save us just in case we are working in these businesses? I've never had that come up before. Um, 
you know, essentially, my understanding, and I'd have to talk to a lawyer to make sure about this, is that you do have some, um, you know, protection just because of the fact you are a student and you're doing something that you were asked to do for the project of the class, and so therefore, if a company were to come after you, this, you know, they, it is possible that they would, uh, that a, um, that the NC State would help you in that case, but again. I don't trust me. I'm not, you know, this is not, illegal. if you're really concerned about that, for some reason, I can point you to NC State Legal, right? Um, this never, that, that question's never come up and we've never had any issues, luckily. Um, and you're saying just in case there's damage to reputation or something technical, goes not as planned. Yeah, um, I have had, I mean, I've had some minor incidents in the past. I had um, a, a, um, a company put together a, sorry, one of the teams put together so this is back when I was at Maryland, and they wanted to do a project for the Maryland uh, golf course, and specifically the pro shop. And so they will put together like a dummy website and a dummy Facebook page uh, for the the golf the, for the pro the uh, the um, the pro shop. And one of the things they did was put up an example of a coupon on the Facebook page, right? That was like come in and. Uh, Buy one set of golf balls, get one free, right? And people started printing out this coupon from the Facebook page and taking it in to the real pro shop. And this happened like almost a year after they did the project. And so I didn't have any access to the website, right? Um, I didn't have any control over it. Um, but I was able to reach out to the team and they shut down. But actually, the way I started the conversation when they called me up was said, oh, really? My students... Facebook page that they put up as kind of an example for a class is getting more hits than your Facebook pages, then maybe you should think about hiring these guys as uh, your digital marketers, right? Um, anyway, so long story short, I've never had any issues with this. Um, uh, you, you could talk to NC State Legal if you think, if you're concerned or worried about this in any way. Um, this is also part of the reason why I ask you to work with a company uh, that you have a, a, a good relationship with it already. And, you know, you could always talk to someone about working with them and that. If, if, if you're worried about this, if you're really worried about this, there's a simple solution, which is just don't publish any of your actual content that you're creating for the company, right? Uh, keep it all like on a, on, a, on a Google Drive or something like that that you can share with me. And I've had students, it's perfectly okay to do that, right? Like you can just create the marketing report and the marketing plan without putting any of the content into public view. You don't have to do that for this class, okay? So hopefully uh, that answers your questions, Ayush. And if you have any additional ones, please let me know. So that's all I have to go over for today. Just checking to make sure there aren't any other questions or concerns that have come in during while I've been talking, but I don't see any. Um, if you have additional questions or concerns, please shoot me an email. I will be back streaming again with you live one week from today at 5 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, and kind of get started on those project introductions. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.